Okay, it's noon. Okay, well, thank you all so much for being here. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for being here both in the room, and I know we have quite a few folks on Zoom, so thank you for joining us as well. I'm really excited to welcome you on behalf of Iona and the Institute for Thomas Paine Studies to History Needs Collecting, which is a conversation between Mr. Sid Lapidus and Dr. Karen Wolf. Sid and Karen have both been longtime supporters of the ITPS, and it's wonderful to have them both here. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, in the spirit of trying to keep it as informal as possible, per Sid's very smart comments, um, before we begin that, that conversation, I do have a few folks that I need to thank. Um, I want to briefly thank Laura Doherty and the Advancement Office for their help in organizing and promoting. Um, our Provost, Dr. Mulligan, who's with us today. Um, Anna Sokeman and the facilities team for making the space look so great and as well as our library colleagues for sharing the room with us. Um, Amanda Lavia and Chartwell's Catering for the awesome looking lunch. And please stay for lunch, there is a lot of food. Um, and Blake Kinney and Anthony Scotcha for all our IT and tech needs. And of course, the amazing library and digital services team, Tony Iodice, Casey Hampsey, and Aidan Callahan, who make these hybrid events possible. And many thanks as well to my ITPS colleagues, Michael Crowder and Kellen Henneford. With that, it's, I'm, I'm just very, very excited again to introduce Sid and Karen. Uh, the idea for History Needs Collecting came out of several years of generous and exciting donations from Sid to Iona in the form of an extensive of almost 200 books now, including antique bibliographies, rare volumes, and edited collections, really just essential reading from historians over the last 40 years, all of which are invaluable research materials for Iona students, faculty, and interested members of the New Rochelle, New York, and even international history communities. The Lapidus Collection is largely focused on materials that study and consider the age of revolutions, the founding of the United States, the history of slavery and anti-slavery, and of course, the man himself, Thomas Paine. It is an invaluable collection and resource for so many reasons, particularly for those looking to research in the Thomas Paine National Historical Association, a lot of acronyms, archive. Itself also an archive of understudied items for a lot of different disciplinary subjects and a lot of different interests. And for students who want to check it out, if you go right around that corner, it's the collection of shelves that say the Lapidus Collection on them. So you should take a look. Um, Sid's reputation as a collector, philanthropist, and along with Ruth Lapidus, an invaluable supporter of the study of history, is so well known that I'll keep my intro, again, as brief as possible. For those students in the room, Sid was a history major uh, at Princeton University and went on to law school before working at Warburg Pincus, a private equity firm. Sid has been involved with many history organizations as a trustee and board member, from the New York Historical Society to the American Antiquarian Society to the Omohundro Institute and the American Jewish History Society. Hi. Hey, how are you? Um, Ruth and Sid also founded the Lapidus Center for the Historical Analysis of Transatlantic Slavery at the New York Public Library Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. If anybody hasn't been to the Schomburg, it's really worth, um, really worth the trip. Through this work, Sid has also spent um, a fair amount of time, I think, with Dr. Karen Wolf. Karen is a historian of gender, family, and politics in the 18th century British Americas, and her forthcoming book, bless you, Lineage, Genealogy, and the Power of Connection in Early America is going to be just incredible. You'll be probably reading it in some history classes in the not too distant future. She was the executive director of the Omohundro Institute from 2013 to 2021, and a professor of history at William and Mary before joining the faculty at Brown University where Karen also works as the Beatrice and Julio Mario Santo Domingo Director and Librarian of the John Carter Brown Library. As a librarian, historian, and administrator, Karen has extensive experience of just how much history does need collecting. And with that, I will turn it over to Karen. An extended introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Nora. It is such a pleasure to be here. Um, and also, I'm sorry that I didn't have my choreography right. I'm so used to 
following Sid in so many things, I was ready to go after. <laughs> so it's um, it's just such a pleasure, uh, such a special pleasure to be here. I remember the origins of the ITPS, um, and in part through a conversation with Sid and the administration here at Iona, and then Nora's appointment was particularly exciting. Sid means a great deal to me, and I won't say a lot about that because I'll choke up and I'm famously like reclaimed at these kinds of situations. Um, but Sid has been a mentor um, for many years as a thinker, a leader, really uh, just an inspirational figure for historians and for those of us who really care about how the past influences the present. Sid is a very singular character. Nora asked me though to speak about um, the broad themes of why collecting and collections are so important and why the nexus of collecting and research and scholarship is so vital. So a key driver of advanced historical scholarship over the last 50 years has been increased access to primary sources. We can think about even 50 years ago, uh, scholarly editions being newly published. We might not think about the papers of Thomas Jefferson between covers as a real advance for scholarly research, but in point of fact, they were. These were the kinds of scholarly editions, these kinds of intentional aggregations that made primary sources available, not just to scholars, but also to the public at large. I was recently reading, <laughs> because I was being asked to give a talk about scholarly editions, I went to the shelves of the reference collection at the John Carter Brown Library, and I just thought, what scholarly editions could I pull off the shelf to say something about why editions are important? And I turned to the documents, the naval documents of the American Revolution, which isn't really my thing. Um, it's not really my wheelhouse. Uh, published by the Naval Historical Office, um, and the first volume had an introduction from then President John F. Kennedy. And in that introduction to that first volume of publication, Kennedy wrote in, signed it on July 4th of 1963, so just months before he was brutally assassinated, he wrote about how primary sources and access to source materials were so essential for democratic governance. He was already looking in 1964 forward to the bicentennial in 1976. Talk about forward thinking. This is the kind of forward thinking access to primary source materials that in fact Sid has forwarded um, in the entire time I've known him and long before that. But scholarly editions are one way that we have access to primary sources, scholars pulling together manuscript materials. Another way is through funded research at collections, at libraries like the John Carter Brown Library or the American Antiquarian Society, where Sid did so much to lead research. Digitization is another way that primary source materials become available to all of us to study. But none of this is possible, neither the scholarly editions or the funded research fellowships or digitization, without the work that collectors have been doing for centuries. There are different kinds of collecting. I'll bet each and every one of us has something that we collect, whether we think about it as collecting or not. You have collections of something. We all do. But professional collecting, which is what I do at the John Carter Brown Library, that is, we're acquiring regularly in a programmatic way for our library of the early Americas, is very different from the kind of expert collecting that someone like Sid is doing. I don't distinguish professional collecting like that libraries do and amateur collecting because that is the wrong way to think about this. What people like Sid have been doing is really expert collecting, developing expertise that in fact goes far beyond what librarians are often able to do, to bring together materials where they see a thematic coherence, and then they express that thematic coherence through this particular collection. It's an act of extraordinary historical interpretation, I would argue, collecting. It brings a perspective on a particular subject. When I was at the New York uh, Rare Books uh, Antiquarian Book Festival um, in April, the first time I'd been there as an acquiring librarian, I saw a really wonderful book dealer, uh, Rebecca Romney, talking about why she was selling a collection of Amy Winehouse, the late singer Amy Winehouse's semi-trashy um, paperback novels because they had been 
annotated with marginalia by Winehouse. Some of that marginalia was just in the form of little tiny hearts and notes about what movies she was going to. And Romney gave this really excellent talk about how that collection actually expressed something about Amy Winehouse. It really told us something about that time and that place, about being a young woman who had artistic ambitions, who had angst and lots of troubles in a particular time and moment. And bringing those things together in a collection was a kind of interpretive act. This is the kind of interpretive act that a collection like the ones that Sid has pulled together um, has shared with so many. Collecting um, identifies themes, it brings materials together, but not all collections become of research use. To return to Sid's wonderfulness, which you can see is the theme that I said I wasn't going to spend too much time on, but is in, I'm drawn to inexorably. Um, what, part of what makes it so extraordinary is that Sid has committed his collection to research use. Many collections, for good reasons, some for not great reasons, but some for really good reasons, remain private. That is, they stay in private hands. It is a great joy to collect. It is um, a kind of a wonderful thing to have a collection. But Sid's dedication has been to the research interest of collections. So in the collections that he has helped to create and helped to sponsor at Princeton and at the Schomburg, most notably at the Lapidus Center, which is really extraordinary, also a wonderful collection at William and Mary and the materials that Nora talked about here at Iona. He has dedicated those collections to the interests of scholars, students, and researchers. And I think what's interesting is not only the individual items that he has donated, that he has brought together first himself and then, and then donated, but when we think about them as a collection in and of themselves, they tell us, I'm not going to compare Sid to Amy Winehouse, well, maybe I am actually, um, but they tell us something about why he brought them together. They t give us a sense of an intellectual moment in time and a kind of intentional act, an interpretive act of bringing these materials together for a specific and important purpose. So I have a soapbox that I carry around with me, and you might not be able to see it, but it's here, um, which is about the importance of early American history. And I stand on that soapbox at every opportunity. I do think that the future of democracy, which I think many of us agree is in peril at the moment, in part rests on a better and fuller understanding of our early American past, of a really firm conviction that we need to contend with the complexity and the inherent violence of that past in order to appreciate the potential for a real democratic future. What collections and collections about early America give us is the opportunity to understand that past that we so deeply need for our present. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my wife, Ruth, stand up for a moment. Wave. Okay. Uh, we just had, hello. We just had the privilege of uh, spending uh, a half hour or so with uh, President, uh, President Seamus Carey. You are fortunate. He's a wonderful guy. He's a brilliant scholar, and he cares about this institution. Uh, and we were lucky to have the conversation with him. Uh, no one has ever called me a singular character until Karen did. I'm not sure what it means, I, and I'm not even sure it's a compliment. <laughs> but I, I'll take it as a compliment. Uh, I'm so pleased to have learned that Iona College upgraded itself to Iona University. Uh, it may be a small, a, a small thing, but I think it is important for you undergraduates. At the margin, it helps. I've gone to a university. It makes it sound bigger, better, than having gone to just a college. So good for you. Uh, I'm so honored to be here with my friend Karen Wolf. She's one of the great American historians. Uh, I'd like to thank my new friend, my newer friend, I, I own a professor, 
Nora Slonimsky, where's Nora? Who's uh, done just a, a great job in arranging this event and the previous event that uh, I spoke at Iona, what was it, four years ago? Same venue, uh, a lot of people that look like you, but weren't you. <laughs> Uh, and, I, and we're fortunate to have the mayor of New Rochelle here, Mayor Noam. I call him Noam because I've known him since he was a kid. <laughs> uh, the title of this event, History Needs Collecting, it certainly does. And I have spent a good part of my life doing just that. Not as a vocation, but as an avocation. I always found time for books and for collecting history. In the grand tradition of American and Catholic higher education, Iona plays an important role. Iona is dedicated to academic excellence, tolerance, and service to the community. In this vein, I had in my collection one of the earliest items by an American Catholic on religious toleration, published in Philadelphia in 1785, entitled An Essay on Toleration, or Mr. O'Leary's Plea for Liberty of Conscience. Its author, Arthur O'Leary, was an Irish priest. I don't know whether he had anything to do with the Irish from Iona, but uh, O'Leary first published this essay in Ireland five years earlier. And the American edition has a preface supporting toleration, presumably written by O'Leary or maybe even his printer. Either one would have been great. As a collector of items pertaining to the expansion of religious freedom and liberties in America, O'Leary's book was something that when it became available, I had to buy. My copy I gifted to many years ago, 2009, to my alma mater, Princeton University, long before I developed a close relationship with Iona. Too bad, because it would have been a perfect gift to Iona, so I apologize. <laughs> As you may know, I'm not an historian, but I'm a lover and collector of books and pamphlets. In short, a bibliophile. If you don't know that word, it's a compliment. I take it as a compliment. It's a lover of books, and I love books. I collect books. I read books less than I used to. Uh, the items I collected are principal, and I've stopped collecting, by the way. I'll get to that. The items I collected are principally first editions from the 18th century, mostly about the politics, economics, and expansion of liberties for Americans. I collected with a transatlantic focus, having bought items from America, England, and France with English imprints, meaning published in England, mostly London, English imprints accounting for over 50% of my holdings. And I estimate that over an adult lifetime of collecting, I have bought over 4,000 books and pamphlets. Like all serious collectors, and I guess that's what I was, I eventually had to consider how to dispose of my collection. And we collectors only have three choices, or combinations thereof. One, keep the collection in the family. My family had no interest in my book collection. N-O-N-E, that's dad's thing. We have our own. Second option is sell all or part, which I had no interest in doing. And thirdly, to donate all or part to various archival organizations, I gladly chose the gifting option. I became a collector, not by deliberate choice, but by chance. I graduated from Princeton long ago, 1959, 
And two months later, I bought my first rare book. I had gone to uh, London with a uh, high school friend of mine, and we thought we had the same interests. We didn't. He was out looking for girls, and I was looking at booksellers' windows. <laughs> I don't know who had the better time. <laughs> and while peering through one of these windows, dusty it was, I noticed the 1792 edition of Tom Paine's Rights of Man. I probably would not have bought it if Tom Paine had not been a neighbor of mine. What am I talking about? I passed his homestead often, as it is on North Avenue, a mile north of here, diagonally across from New Rochelle High School, where I spent three fabulous years. Too bad Tom and I missed each other, only by 175 years. Since the price of the Rights of, Man, Rights of Man pamphlet that I bought was less than five bucks, and that was all that I could afford at the time, I bought it. That was the least expensive book I ever purchased. How times have changed. That book would likely sell today for at least $25,000, and perhaps more. My collecting career had started. By the way, I've never sold a book. I donate books. I don't have any left. I gave them all away to appropriate institutions. Payne is arguably the most important pamphleteer in American history. He certainly holds pride of place in my 2009 Princeton catalog of my collection which celebrated my 50th reunion. The cover of the catalog depicts an engraving of Payne, modeled after a painting in 1791 by a Philadelphia painter, Charles Wilson Peel. And if any of you know anything about American art history, and I hope you do, if not, take a course. Uh, he was important. In the engraving on Payne's lap is an open book with the momentous words, rights of man. Early in the Revolutionary War, General George Washington, Washington's army was being badly beaten. Many soldiers went home when their enlistment was over or they simply deserted. Washington asked Payne, who had, had accompanied the army, to write something akin to Common Sense, which Payne had published in February of 1776, Washington asked him to write something as a morale builder for the troops. Payne's essay called The American Crisis, and it was a crisis in December uh, 1776. Uh, Washington ordered it to be immediately read, after he had read it, to all of his officers and soldiers. The essay starts with these momentous lines, quote, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country, but he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of men and women. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. Nobody writes like that anymore. Maybe not even I own graduates and students, but you gotta learn to do that. My aim in these brief remarks is to help you better understand why, in my view, history needs collecting, the title of this. Uh, event. I hope that I have at least partially succeeded in making you aware as to why I think history needs collecting. It is important as an American citizen and a citizen of any place. But it's important today in modern America in particular. Some people think we have a crisis. I think it's just a large bump. I'm optimistic and uh, he was more pessimistic than I am. I think we will get through this fine. 
Uh, there are lots of problems along the way. This is a different kind of era. All of a sudden we have a resurgence of what people call states' rights instead of national rights and liberties. And I think in large parts an excuse to do things that shouldn't get done. Having said that, thank you for listening. I'll sit down. I, I think Karen and I will take questions. Okay, good. Are we talking right into the mic there? Okay, all right. So Sid, um, Nora is giving me the opportunity to ask you some questions about history and collecting. And I wanted to start with that very first volume. That's the first time actually I remember hearing you talk about the contemporary value of that, the monetary value of that item, holy cow. That's quite some return there. Um, but I wonder if you, this is a kind of a setup question, I guess. Um, I wondered if you remembered looking through that window and if you remember what it was that struck you about, because I'm betting that window was full of lots of books and I'm betting that there were lots of interesting books there and another person might have chosen a different one. So Tom Paine, hometown hero, I guess, in a way. It's certainly a neighbor, let's call it that, a neighbor um, of previous centuries. But is, was there something else about the book that grabbed you? Like, do you remember looking at it and thinking, this is something I'd like to have? Yes. <laughs> Next question. <No. laughs> uh, yeah, I was kind of absent-mindedly, can you hear me? Yeah. Absent-mindedly looking at this through this big bookstore's window and a couple of items there and it just jumped out, out at me. Tom Paine, Rights of Man. As I mentioned in my talk a few minutes ago, Tom Paine was, was my guy. <laughs> He's New Rochelle. He lives here. I lived here. The mayor's here. I mean, uh, five bucks? I could afford five bucks. If we're 10, I'd think twice about it, but five bucks I could then afford. Uh, I went in and bought the item, met the bookseller, and hey, this is interesting stuff. Uh, the bookseller was maybe at half the number of these books, but he didn't have all these white labels on it, because these were all for sale. These are just for, for use. Uh, it changed my life. You said, I've heard you um, mention this moment of that first purchase before, but I've always wondered, like, what happened in the immediate next? Because I know the Sid Lapidus of an extraordinary collection. I knew the Sid Lapidus um, of that donation to Princeton. I knew the volume of the 2009 um, exhibit which is incredible, by the way, if you have a chance to f find that. Um. And by the way, you can find it. You just go online, put in Sid Lapidus, uh, what's the name of the book? Uh, selections from the collection of Sid Lapidus. There are many things that you could buy. It's the same thing that I, last time I looked, about six months ago, the prices ranged from $10 to $170. Mm. Buy the $10 copy. <laughs> It's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, so you can see this 2009 volume online. And I think Princeton actually has a version, like an online version of it, too. Yeah, sure, they? you can see it online, but go yeah. buy one. Yeah. But, but, but what happened in between, like 1959 and 2009? Can you just tell us a little bit about what happened after, like, that summer of 1959? Did, was that the only book that you brought home from London that summer? Like, is it, I imagine you, I have two pictures in my mind. One is 
first of all, in, in both of these pictures, you have a backpack. I don't know if you had a backpack, but in my mind, you do. And in this, this is a world pre-backpacks. Okay. All right, so you had a case. <laughs> and in one, in one of these cases, you've just got, you know, you've got whatever you took with you to Europe, and you've got this one copy of Rights of Man, and that's the only thing. And in another one, actually, you went back to the bookshop, and you checked out other bookshops that summer, and you've got more than Rights of Man in your case. So I guess what I'm asking is, what happened after you bought the Rights of Man? Like, what was the next, the, the next thing you bought? What happened, and how long was that? It wasn't on that trip. Aha, okay. So the case on only had Rights of Man going home. Got it, okay. Yes, and it probably, I, I don't recall, but it probably was many years later. Okay. Many years later. This is, I remember, I just graduated from college. Uh, I, was, I was, when we got home, I, I started going to Columbia Law School, uh, which I think I said was a mistake. I should not have gone to law school. <laughs> you really have, if you go to law school, the first year is important. The second and third years are trade school stuff. Uh, but you have to be a lawyer to go to law school, or at least after the first years, think about, okay, what do I do next? Uh, I was so bored in law school that in my first year, I took uh, courses at NYU Business School. Now, that was interesting. Law school, where was I? <laughs> you were going to tell me about the next book you bought. Oh, I don't remember what it was. So you went to law school and business school-ish. No, I, yeah, okay, yeah, two courses, that doesn't count. <laughs> so after you bought The Rights of Man, then it actually was some time before you returned to really collecting with a vengeance, as it were, or with enthusiasm, let's call it that. Yes, that's a better word than vengeance. <laughs> uh, I think of tolerance, not vengeance. <laughs> I don't recall. Uh, it probably was after law school, probably was when I started work, mm -hmm. and I had some extra, <laughs> extra dollars in my pocket, even though mm -hmm. Ruth and I got married when we were young, uh, and we had children uh, not that long after. Uh, I had to have some extra money to use, and I, as you, of course we know, I, I, I loved history, so I started buying things. I don't know what the second book was. Mm. Mm. I probably could look it up. Mm. I'm sure I could, mm. uh, but uh, my database is a lot different than your database. We didn't have computers. <laughs> we had paper. Yes, we had typewriters, but I couldn't type well. That's a different story. I went to Nosha High School, as I said, and I had a, a short course in typing. And if it wasn't for this young lady sitting next to me who helped me with the typing, I wouldn't even have passed typing. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe the, I, could ask, I could ask this question a different way, which is, you know, when was the first time Ruth said there are too many books in the house? Um, but I, I guess what I'm We can. <laughs> I assume you, you did. The answer is she never said that. She says, what the hell? What are we going to do with all these books as it kept growing? I, we'll find places. This is important. We'll find places. So my den and every, and every place we've lived we had bookshelves, mm -hmm. and if it overflows the bookshelves in one room, it goes to another room. You could always buy bookshelves or have them built or whatever. Is there another book? Bookshelves are one of the great collections of mankind. <laughs> Is there another book that you remember as specifically as you remember buying that first copy of Rights of Man? Like, are there other books that you thought, like, that were in a moment when you acquired them, um, you thought, wow, that is really special and important? A book, yes, is the answer. A book I bought a couple of years ago 
and I don't recall even who, which institution I gave it to. It was, as I recall, published in Italy in uh, before 1500. Mm. Remember, Gutenberg in invented the printing press around 1451. These are early days of printing. And any book that's published before uh, 1500 is called Incunabula. I think I pronounced that right. If not, it's close. Uh, and so this book that I just came across that by an Irish American, I remember his name, Pat Walsh, mm. underpriced it. Mm. I didn't complain. And it was, I'm trying to remember what it was about. It was an, it was an attack on Jews. Uh, but we have to be careful with how we attack them. Mm. It's kind of a, a caution to the uh, citizens of, I forget the Italian town where it was published and printed. I know that, um, that history of toleration, history of liberties has been incredibly important to how you have collected and thus it's been very important to the Lupita's collections at the places that you've donated. Are those, did you feel those themes developing as you were collecting? Like, or did that drive your collecting from the start? I mean, we could say that Rights of Man shows a particular set of subjects that would inform your thinking, you know, for the next 50 years, 60 years. But, um, but I wonder if, if, it, if it grew naturally or if you knew right at the start that these no, were the it, themes. It, it, it was pursue. evolutionary. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing, one book leads to another book, one interest leads to another book. Uh, as I became a customer of many booksellers, uh, they would send me catalogs, which they sent to everybody, and that was a time when this is pre-internet world. Uh, and after I started buying some more stuff, hey, this guy's a customer. So they started sending me uh, letters, not emails yet, uh, about would you be interested in this, would you be interested in that? And so I became an, an important customer of uh, book collectors, now, mostly in the UK, by the way, some in France. Uh, I've even bought some books in Italian, but they were from, I think, English book collectors. I don't speak Italian, but I could fake it, I could speak, I could order in an Italian restaurant. And the waiter says, and then he starts a asking me a question in Italian, I says, sorry. <laughs> I could just read the menu. Uh, I, I can read French a little bit, enough to know whether I want what's being offered. So one of the things that's been so important... Oh, by, oh, oh excuse yeah. me. And by mm. the way, what's, in, what's important to me as a, as a book buyer are the descriptions by the booksellers. Every book has to have a description of what it is. And some dealers do a wonderful job of describing what it is and why it may be important to a particular kind of collector. Some booksellers do a crappy job. And unless you know what the book is, you're not gonna buy it. Library. Which I guess is true in most businesses anyway. Well, I think it has a, it has a particular relevance here in that you know, librarians talk about the importance of um, access and discovery, big words in, in library land. And um, access and discovery are interlinked because nobody can access the books unless they can find out what the books are about. That's what discovery is. Now we use online catalogs. Um, but a lot of the cataloging for rare, book, uh, for rare books, that is the information about those rare books, the information that the libraries that hold them share about those books can originate with the booksellers. The booksellers often do a lot of research 
about the particular book that they're selling. They'll give you the context of it. They'll use bibliographies generated by libraries like mine to say that there's a copy at the Huntington Library and at the John Carter Brown Library, and those are the only two in North America, or they'll do this research, and it, it's really important. So that, that kind of discoverability um, can somehow be, and can often be enhanced by the work that the booksellers do. So I think it has, it had a value for the collector, because it tells you about what the thing is that you're buying, but ultimately it can have, uh, it can be really helpful for readers and researchers at these libraries. Of, of, of course you're right. Uh, I want to address those of you who are librarians here. I attended one of my early meetings of the Library Committee of the New York Historical Society, which is a wonderful building on opposite Central Park, Central Park West at 77th Street. It is a great source for those of you who are majoring in history or the past, for American mostly. They got great collections. Anyway, at a Library Committee meeting, uh, I, uh, somehow the question came up as to, well, we have a whole bunch of, we have piles of books that are just sitting there, but we don't know what's in them. To which my response was, the most important thing you could do with piles of books is catalog them. Nobody knows they exist if they're in piles. Mm -hmm. Piles have to tur be turned into catalogs. Uh, that's true in, for any collector of anything, of any business of anything. I'm involved, we're trying to get archives of organizations for profit and nonprofit for various organizations. Unless you know what the organization has, unless they know, they can't donate it. They don't know what it is. They can't get a valuation for it. So knowing what you have is very important, particularly for libraries, because how can users find what you have if you haven't cataloged it? Yeah. It's crucial. Otherwise, it's just another piece of paper. Well, when I took my current job, Sid, you gave me one of the most important pieces of advice I've had, which is you said, if you want to expand your collection, just catalog it <laughs> and it's really true all libraries have cataloging backlogs this is a pitch for anybody who's interested in information systems and information science i'm telling you librarianship is extraordinary the opportunities to think about information infrastructure in libraries is really unparalleled and i want to make a pitch for cataloging too which is incredible work it's really metadata creation um anyway but, uh, but back, to, <laughs> back to a question about, about your collection, Sid. Um, we were talking Libraries about- Libraries are important, keep, call, keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, we could stay on the subject of libraries are important, but let me just shift this slightly to say that um, one of the things you did when you decided to donate your collections is donate them to places where they would be used. That is, your, your, um, your choice of uh, repository was places where scholars and students would do research from these materials. What drove you, or what made you, maybe this is an unanswerable question, um, but what made you think that it was important for the collections to actually be used by scholars? Firstly, as far as I'm concerned, no question you ask is unanswerable. You may not like the answer, <laughs> or I may fudge it, but I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Okay. Uh, I've been involved with libraries uh, for quite a while, and uh, I know what they, I know what they should have. So when I think about giving away my collection, as you know, I've given 100% of it, donated it. Uh, almost all the time, I have in mind which is the appropriate library where it could best belong, best be used, not just be sit on the shelf because it's always nice that this library, oh, we have that book, but unless it's used, it's just 
lying on the shelf. So it's got to be, I, I, I try to, to, to direct my giving, my book giving to those libraries that specifically have an, a, uh, I'll use the word in a different context, a clientele that would be interested in that particular volume. Well, it's made an enormous difference because if scholars don't have access to these materials, they can't interpret them. And if they can't interpret them, then they know less about the past, or they certainly have a more partial view of the past. I mean, your, um, your collection on slavery and the transatlantic slave trade that um, forms the center of the Lapidus collection at the Schomburg, for example, super important and well, okay, so unusual. Me, so so let, me, let me answer your previous questions more directly. Mm. So yes, I developed a very important collection, I'm told it's very important, uh, about the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, in part, I was interested in that because of all things, uh, a group in Williamsburg where I first met Karen, we had, in today's phrase, it would be called an offsite we went for the first time for a, a conference in Ghana. Ghana's on the th west coast of Africa. And Ghana was a place where slaves were sent to the Americas. Uh, and from the resort, and it was a, for African purposes, it was a nice resort at the time, uh, you could see the, on the hill, the forts that had been used for fortifications in the various times that the Western countries were, I'll use it specific, were invading uh, Africa. And why were they doing that? To acquire slaves. And had they acquired slaves, they didn't go inland. African slave traders bought slaves, brought slaves to the coast. And that's, so there was, these places were holding, uh, holding, uh, what's a good word for it? Enslaved people. Uh, holding sites for enslaved people. And in one of the places in this port in Ghana, uh, as they left, to go onto the slave ship to Americas, there was a sign, point of no return. On the slave journeys to the Americas, there's a dispute as to the number of people, but there were a significant number of people who jumped overboard. They were shackled in the slave ship. Uh, they were permitted hour or two a day to go uh, on the deck, but most of the time they spent in this awful, awful room. I've seen one of them. The holding, no, I've seen not on the ship, but in the holding thing in, in, in Ghana, a room a third of this size, a third, with one light and one exit and they could be in there for days, and they were shackled. This is just, the stuff that was done in the slave trade is just incredible, incredible. And I suggest for research, one of the most interesting things you could do is take a look, is do some work on what the slave trade was about. And by the way, the slave trade in America, which is understudied, and there's a great book by a historian whose name I can't Greg think. Greg O'Malley. Greg O'Malley, who my Karen and I knew, yeah. <laughs> uh, Karen may still know, about the, the slave trade in the in Amer Americas. Slaves came into Savannah, Charleston, and from there, the, slave, uh, the traders, di quote, distributed as if it was a product, slaves to the plantations in the South. Slaves were a commodity. 
in whatever sense you put it, to be bought, to be sold, and you've seen some of the movies about it, but. Uh, so was that collection, in a sense, the, um, not to jump on that, but to, was it was almost the reverse of your emphasis on liberty and your collection that emphasized liberty, then you started collecting on slavery. Is that, uh, you, is that a fair uh, characterization? Know, I, yes, I never thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. This is unliberty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always thought that the super interesting connection between your collecting on liberty, freedom of conscience, and slavery, that the, the essence really there are many of the fundamental rights um, articulated in the founding of the United States imperfectly. Um, yeah, this is the opposite. Mm. Yeah. Lincoln well, was a great man. Indeed. Um, I think we only have a few minutes left. I'm watching Nora. Um, but can I ask, do I get one more minute? One more. Okay, I, ask one, I have one last question for you, Sid, which is, what advice would you give to young collectors? Go for it. <laughs> uh, you have to have a passion for uh, books. You have to be interested in the topic. Uh, it is good intellectual exercise. You could do it in your spare time. Uh, it, it broadens you your, as a person. It gives you something to talk about with your friends that they don't know anything about. And most of the times they'll say, they don't care. <laughs> but do it anyway. As a matter of fact, I have many friends over the years. There's hardly anybody who cares more than hearing one paragraph about what I collect. It's amazing. They just don't care. I do it anyway. <laughs> and you can make other friends who do care. I can't. There we <laughs> go. OK. All right. Thank you so much, Sid. That seems like actually a perfect note, because there are clearly people on the webinar who care. Um, and they already have questions for you. So the very first question is from Paul Sperry. Oh, and, I just uh, had lunch with him. Oh, go, oh there you go. So you have, see, more friends who want to hear you talk about this. Um, he was asking, um, is there a book that you have wanted to add to your collection but never had the opportunity to do so? Yes, but I don't recall what they were. <laughs> Well, are there any well, other questions? Can I just say that okay. that is such a great answer because that suggests that yeah. there are moments when there was a book that you know was really, really of interest to you and a great focus, and then your focus shifted. And then there was another one that seemed like, which I think is a great point, which is there's never just one, you know? Well, there may be only, only one copy of that, <laughs> but that's rare when there's only one copy of a book left. Uh, but there have been so many books and pamphlets, let's talk about pamphlets, the difference probably being uh, uh, the, the book cover or whether it's uh, just tied with paper with, with string or something like that. Uh, so when I talk books, I'm talking about uh, pamphlets, some pamphlets being 20, 40 pages, some being just one page, I don't even call it a pamphlet, uh, but paper, paper. Oh, yeah, please. Um, I'm curious, do you still go into bookstores? Do you still, if you see a book that you've wanted, you say you're no longer collecting, will you pick it up? No. <laughs> I no longer go into bookstores. Uh, bookstores, as a result of the internet, it's a tough business to be in, particularly in aquarium bookstores. They almost rarely don't exist much anymore. And the, the book trade is now all on the internet. Physical bookstores of antiquarian books, very few. Certainly in America, there are few left in, 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 in London. Hi, um, earlier today you mentioned uh, the least expensive book in your collection uh, being the Thomas Paine uh, being purchased you for $5. You want to know the most expensive? What was the most expensive book? <laughs> You know, I don't remember, but there, of course there was the most expensive by definition. And I had to think a long time, but uh, I went ahead and did it. <laughs> Fortunately, I had the wherewithal 
to be able to do it. And well, that, that's another point. Book collecting is a, call it a hobby, a passion, but it's, it's not the core unless you are a book dealer or whatever. Uh, I was a customer. Is uh, there perhaps a book that you was not as expensive, but to you is priceless, that you would never part with? Oh, I parted with everything. I parted with everything. Uh, I believe that, I think Karen mentioned earlier, that books are not just to be kept on shelves in a private library. Books are to be given to places where they can be available to students, scholars, researchers, and the like. To just keep them in a library of your own is a, what's there's a phrase now, a categorical error. <laughs> Whatever the hell that means. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we've got one more question on the webinar and then over to Rick. Uh, thank you so much, sitting Karen. This is a question from Joseph Edelman, uh, who is asking, uh, who's wondering, uh, from both of you, uh, about how academics and librarians can build collaborative relationships with collectors. Or he has another more blunt way of putting it. Uh, how can we, and I think he means historians and librarians, uh, how can we convince more collectors to be engaged with the study of history as you are? You want to take a shot? <laughs> well, I'm coming at this from the perspective of a longtime academic and a relatively new librarian. Um, so, uh, and that's capital L librarian, that's my title, but I'm not a trained as a librarian, and that really does make a difference. But I would say that um, for special collections libraries, relationships with collectors are enormously important. And for a library like the John Carter Brown Library, having collectors on our board um, for many, many decades has been incredibly important. And I think Sid would say the same thing about his service um, at the American Antiquarian Society. I mean, just a side note here, what a great moment that was. I still, I have a copy of this picture on my um, computer of Sid and Ellen Dunlap um, when the AAS got the National Humanities Medal from President Obama. That was pretty great. Um, but Sid was the chair of the board at the AAS. You know, that was a collector leading, really, the board of a major research library. So collectors play an incredibly important role on the boards of special collections libraries. And, you know, collectors know collectors. Not every collector is going to be interested in working with that kind of a library and working with a research community, but many are. I think what's in, been interesting to me is to discover how many collectors didn't know they could have a relationship with research libraries um, and how fruitful that relationship could be, that it wouldn't just be a relationship of the library trying to persuade them to part with their books, <laughs> but rather um, that the librarians and the staff would really appreciate how much they can learn from collectors who are really experts in their um, collecting area of focus. Um, and that a shared love of and belief in the power of books to illuminate uh, could bring us together. So I guess to answer Joe's question very directly, I think um, collectors help librarians by introducing us to more collectors. Mr. Lapidus and Dr. Wolf, thank you so much for uh, coming to Iona and um, your presentation was wonderful. I, I want to thank you for your generous donation to the collection of Iona University Libraries. Um, I want to thank you for the plug of the library. <laughs> um, and I can't believe someone stole my question. I was wondering, did, did one book get away that you really wanted? and or you, you, you didn't get. Um, I just went on to the next one. Yeah. <laughs> but the last thing I want to say is, I, and I personally think, the book is not dead. And I, I, I think that um, we're, we're finding that with, with uh, the, the physical touch of a book and being able to carry it around and refer to is very different than going on a screen. Um, 
That's well, great to hear. Yes, I believe that. <laughs> so thank you. You know what? Make it happen. Make it continue. Well, we probably can maybe have one final question. Does anyone else have anything to ask? Nora, I wondered if Sid wanted to answer Joe's question. Oh, yeah, of course, please, yes. In, um, in Remind me. So Joe asked about how librarians and scholars can work better, can work with collectors. What's the best way that we can all work collaboratively together? And my answer was to use, you know, board service as an example. But I don't know if you have other examples or other thoughts. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot. Some things I don't have opinions on. Rarely. Ask my wife. <laughs> any any last questions for everybody or no okay well i think then we are we are just a little bit over time so we can definitely we those were great notes to conclude on i just want to say again thank you both so much this was absolutely terrific um and let's get a round of applause for sitting here <laughs>